Okay, so this was a catastrophe for these peasants. So you, at, you have virtually the end of the peasant life, uh, that way of life in which people could supply themselves with their, with their needs. They, they became virtual slaves. Um, or they became these wage waivers, which Marx and probably Belloc would say were sort of virtual slaves. Belloc mentions, and he makes a big deal out of this, and I think this is, his Catholicism doesn't shine through in this book all that much, but, but it does in this point. He says that a big step towards the dispossession of people was Henry VIII's taking of the Catholic church lands in the 16th century. He says that was the beginning of the end because what happened was Henry, after the wake of the Protestant Reformation, Henry decided you know, to, to establish his own church and get rid of Catholicism in his land. And so he um, not only did that, but he, but he confiscated the property of the church, but then apparently he needed funds more than he needed the, the property right away. And so, um, and the, the large landowners had, in England had already become quite powerful and wealthy um, and they basically bought it out or he gave it away to them in exchange for their aid and for their continued loyalty. And so he lost that power. And this was the beginning of a decline in the power of the crown. And it, in Belloc says, this was that point when a small number of families owned about 50% of the agricultural land in, in England. And why is England so important? Because you may be wondering, maybe are we just sort of favoring English history here for some reason? No, it's, it's because in this theory, that's where it began. And because it started first in England, other countries then had to compete and follow suit. So literally Belloc thinks that the origins of this transformation towards capitalism began in England. And I think Meskin Woods also um, basically says the same thing. Okay, here's a quote from Belloc. He says, the lands and accumulated wealth of the monasteries were taken from the hands of their old possessors with the intention of vesting them in the crown, but they passed as a fact into the hands of an already wealthy section of the community who became in the succeeding hundred years, the governing power of England. So place that in the context of the English civil wars, which led to more or less the, the Cromwell government and even after the restoration of Charles II um, and moving forward into the glorious revolution, there was more and more of a diminishment of the crown to the point where you get to the glorious revolution, which was 1688, you've got basically the crown becomes more or less an executive figurehead more and more, right? Um, and uh, the, the parliament becomes dominated by the bourgeois by this new class of wealthy people who don't have their wealth due to their, um, you know, their inheritance of family wealth, not due to their nobility, but due, their, due to their ability to accumulate capital and to exploit labor, okay? I don't know, anybody want to add anything, including you know, Spencer, am I, am I hitting on the right stuff here? We good? I think so. All right. All right, thanks. Um, another quote, which goes along really well with Wood's um, point, Bellock says, with peasants dispossessed of their land and in need of paid work by 1700, England had already become capitalist. So here he's disagreeing to a certain extent with, with Marx, which I'm sure he was aware of Marx's theory, right? And now, does he really disagree with Marx? Not, not totally, because actually Marx in Capital One does acknowledge this as the beginning of the transformation. But I think for a lot of people, Marxists appeared to be saying that it, that it was the factory labor, the factory situation, you know, the incredible buildup of technology and the sinking of labor into that technology and then the use of that technology to exploit future labor, that that was the beginning of capitalism. 
Marx at, at the very least acknowledges that no, the stage was set by this earlier confiscation of land and the throwing the peasants off the land, which created this huge mass of vulnerable people that just were just ripe for exploitation. But anyway, the quote says, England had already become capitalist. She had already permitted a vast section of her population to become proletarian. And it is this and not the so-called industrial revolution, which accounts for the terrible social condition in which we find ourselves today. Okay. So he points out, and this, I found this really interesting because I think um, we still live in this world in which our ideological vision of what capitalism is, is not what it is, but it's almost like our idea of capitalism is more real than capitalism <laughs> itself, right? So Bellet points this out, he calls it the moral base. And the moral base is like Lockean liberal theory, basically. The moral base of capitalism says that, you know, everybody in the state is free, is a free individual who can make decisions, who basically is in a social contract of their own free will and agrees to the arrangements of the society that people have property rights and accumulate property, okay? That theft and fraud are illegal and the state should stop this from happening and enforce the law so that people are not defrauded of what they gain, okay? Contracts, according to this moral base, are always between free equal people and either of them can break the contract if the other also breaks it if they if the agreement is not held to. Um, and also there's this idea that as individuals, we are responsible for the harm that we do. Okay. So equally responsible because we're equal individuals. That's the moral base and that's kind of the ideology that he says prevails, right? But he says the actual reality of capitalism is does not reflect these moral ideals and these expectations. Um, and he follows Marx in this to a great extent. You know, Marx is famous for saying, we're not a state, you know, these, these liberal states are not states of free citizens because, um, because how can they be free when they're basically forced to either work or starve, okay? Um, and they don't have any um, chance to get an education and they can't really, uh, you know, participate in the political process. Um, they don't own property. The vast majority of people will never have property, even though um, in, on paper they may have legal property rights if they could possibly get any. Theft and fraud is okay for the rich. They do it all the time, but not for the poor. Um, Contracts are not between free equals. If one party has a great deal of power and money and the other is like on the edge of, of being homeless and we're not equally responsible for damages. The, and he's gonna talk about this towards the end of the book, but the government basically um, sets the stage for distinguishing very strongly between the owners and the workers, the subservient workers, by saying, owners, if you've got a contract with the workers, it's your responsibility, even if they do the damages. They're not responsible. Belloc took that as a sign of a sort of paternalism and a recognition that the working class were basically being enslaved, right? That they weren't equal contractors and they couldn't, couldn't be responsible for the damages that they did because they literally didn't have the means to be able to pay for those damages. So for the capitalist, the damages the worker do, does is like the price of doing business. Um, Bellock's quote here is, our legal machinery has become little more than an engine for protecting the new owners against the necessities, the demands, or the hatred of a mass of their dispossessed citizens. The vast bulk of so-called free contracts are today leonine contract arrangements which one man was free to take or leave, but to which the other man was not free to take or leave because the second had for his alternative starvation. Okay, so that can't be a free contract. Okay, um, and this is not something just 
that ceased to exist after the after you know the industrial revolution i say it's still the case today for an awful lot of people um and i can i'll get back to that but he does mention what what i would call the welfare state but he calls liberal reformers liberal reformers um will you know offer things that um, will help the masses from starving, um, different welfare programs. Um, back then, back in his day, it might be poor houses, right? And soup kitchen type things run by the government. Um, now these programs are much more sophisticated and extensive, but he would have seen them as basically the government propping up capitalism. Again, something he shares with Marx, the government propping up capitalism so that the they, the capitalists can still get cheap labor. It's being subsidized, okay? Um, so, yes. He says, where there is compulsion applicable by positive law to men of a certain status, and such compulsion is enforced in the last resort by the powers at the disposal of the state, there is the institution of slavery. So he's really making a very radical claim here, that part of it that basically this amounts to slavery. And it's, again, it's papered over and occluded by all these legal arrangements and by the sort of legal individual rights, you know, the, the paper, the rights that are on paper, the freedom that is on paper, but the reality is, is something different, right? Um, and back in his day, uh, he noticed contract law, like I said, which treated differently the capitalists and the workers. He uses that as an example. But today we have things like forced prison labor for free or for very little money. And maybe more important for a lot of people uh, here, you know, work fair. So I put up this, um, this is from the government website having to do with SNAP. We have work fair, right, for benefits in the United States. We don't always use that term, but basically in order to get these benefits, which is food, um, uh, the people have to show that they are working somehow. So for instance, it says, um, if you are 18 to 49 and don't have any dependents, you might need to meet both the general work requirements and an additional work requirement for more than three months in three years. And you can meet these requirements by doing any of these things, including working 80 hours a month for pay for goods and services, unpaid or as a volunteer. And in some cases, what happens is people will go to work for these very low, low wage jobs uh, subsidized by the government for minimum wage. And they have to do that in order to receive their benefits, okay? So they can't hold out for uh, work that um, they might be getting their training for, or they've had training for. Um, they have to take whatever they can get. And this might not be something that people have thought about before in this way, but this creates a subsidized and sort of forced workforce that will work for very cheap wages or even for free, just so that they can continue to um, at least survive with their benefits, okay? Um, so work for, workfare is controversial for a reason. And some of its critics, including the story that I put in uh, put in the um, the Slack uh, the Slack folder, uh, it on examples like that is uh, an article that's very critical of this and basically calls it a modern form of slavery. Uh, typically, it's looked at as in a positive way. Well, people are working for the benefits that they receive, and and they can also get work training for this. You know, and this can actually be good. It can help them get back into the workforce. Um, so, you know, this is the way it's normally received and it may partly be good, but it also partly has this quality of basically supporting um, the, the ready supply of cheap uh, or even free labor, okay? So I think that at least I could say this, Hilaire Belloc would see workfare as a, a form of slavery. State sanctioned, that's exactly what he says. It's the state's enforcement 
of the working arrangements, okay? Um, and another quote from Belloc, just to kind of hammer that point home, the free man can refuse his labor and use that refusal as an instrument wherewith to bargain, while the slave has no such instrument or power to bargain at all, but is dependent for his well-being upon the custom of society, backed by regulation of such of its laws as may protect and guarantee the slave. 